Dear friends in Christ, CNBC Careers believes the 40-hour work week is falling apart. In an article about the history of the work week, it cited studies that show the average American works 44 to 47 hours a week. Some professionals put in 60 plus hours a week and the work's never quite done so long as you have a cell phone that people can call and email at all hours of the day or night. Some factory workers put in 12-hour shifts. Some students and young professionals work second and third jobs, hosting and waitressing on nights and weekends just to pay off the student loans. So much for a restful two-day weekend and a nice 40-hour work week. It's far more than just a bunch of numbers. It's personal. Where did the summer go? Am I the only one asking that question? There's, there's trips up north with the family. There's uh, times to get the house all ready and clean for family coming into town. There's soccer camps. There's uh, VBS. There's uh, trips to drop off kids at soccer camp. There's house projects. There's thinking about back to school time. There's so much to do and so little time. Isn't that the theme of busy, workaholic, hectic Americans? When you take all of that and try and add it onto your plate of typical work and family commitments, it just seems to be too much. In our busy world, we can all relate to the story of Jesus visiting his friends Mary and Martha. The Gospel for today in Luke 10 asks us the question, what's competing for your attention? The many good distractions or the one best necessity? Poor Martha, abandoned and alone, left to fend for herself in making all of the preparations. Once Jesus and his disciples enter town, she quickly opens her home to him. She is the hostess with the mostest. Her mind is here, there, and everywhere. The floor needs to be swept. The house needs to be cleaned. The guest room needs to be arranged. The furniture needs to be arranged. And everything needs to be cleaned up because Jesus is coming to town. Confused and distracted, frazzled and frustrated, busy and burdened. She starts to take it out on her sister. Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. This may be a cry for help. This may be a subtle hint that <clears throat> uh, you clearly are not picking up on my little clues that I could use a little hand here. This may be a rather direct sign that Martha clearly feels she cannot be the hospitality team all by herself. But underneath, she's really taking it out on Jesus. Now, nothing Martha was doing was inherently wrong. She can hardly be critiqued for her apathy. She clearly loves her Lord and wants the best for her Lord, the best accommodations, the best meals, the best stay. Everything must be executed to a T. Everything Martha is doing is a work of industrious hard work commended by the scriptures. Just read through 2 Thessalonians 3 and how the Apostle Paul urges lazy Christians who are being busybodies to get down and start earning the bread they eat. Read through the book of Proverbs and Solomon's practical insight and how the little creatures, the ants, despite their size, still go around and collect the food for themselves to survive. Scan through the epistles and their constant encouragement for Christians to show hospitality to each other. This is nothing other than a fruit of faith for her Savior. 
the creator of the whole world who had no place to lay his head, now suddenly does. Martha often gets a bad rap because this story can be misunderstood. Martha was not doing bad things. Martha was doing good things. What's the problem then? She got distracted. She let the many good things crowd out what was better. What's competing for your attention today? Many good distractions. But Lord, I need to work on the weekend. But Lord, I need to travel for business. But Lord, I need to drop off the kids at soccer camp. But Lord, I need to sleep in after I spend time with my friends on the weekend. But Lord, I need personal time to recuperate on the weekends. But Lord, I need to spend time with my families. But Lord, I need personal time for myself. Now, don't misunderstand. With soccer and sleep, business and work, personal time, family time, and free time, you are all doing good things. You are not doing bad things. What's the problem then? You're distracted. You let the many good distractions crowd out the one best necessity. It's not simply a matter of what all you can cram into your Google calendar. It's a much more fundamental issue. You are telling your Lord, I will determine what is the top priority in my schedule, whether or not it involves you. Then you are no longer the Lord. Then Christ is no longer the Lord of your life. You are. You are dictating what is most important. You are telling Jesus that even more important than what you do for me is what I do for you. You are so consumed with your life of service to your Savior that you forget about letting your Savior serve you. What's competing for your attention? Many good distractions. I look out and see a lot of Marthas, distracted with minds here, there, and everywhere. I know some people probably get distracted in the first half hour of this service and probably the first 10 minutes of this sermon. So what to do? Set the broom aside and slow down. Filter out all of those distractions and come and sit at the feet of Jesus. Poor Mary, accused and attacked, left to salvage a relationship with her sister all by herself. Once Jesus comes through the door, she sits down at his feet. She is the quiet listener, absorbing everything that he has to say, focused on one thing and one thing alone, Jesus' word. And she won't stop calm and collected, focused and fixated, intent and immersed. She hears the critique of Martha screaming at her in the background. She certainly would grant that Martha is consumed with many good things, but she has prioritized the best thing. Only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better and it will not be taken away from her. Instead of getting distracted with what could be done, Mary focuses on what must be done. Instead of getting absorbed in all of the good things of life, Mary prioritizes the one best thing. 
God's word is the one best thing because it's the most needed thing. Why is God's word the one best necessity? It's the most needed because it tells us of the Savior we most needed. When God looked down at our busy world, he knew that we, deep down, really didn't need more time, more productivity apps, or more assistance at work. He knew that if we were given more time, we'd simply find a way to fill it up with more stuff to do. He knew that truly we needed a message of calm and peace in the midst of our busy world. That's exactly what God's word gives. It announces to you that that very rabbi who sat down to teach Mary sat down at the feet of his own rabbis in the temple many years before him. It comforts you with that wonderful message that his perfect record of perfect A-plus Bible study washes away all of your misplaced priorities and distracted thoughts. It reassures you that he has made you his highest priority every single second of his life down to the moment of his death. We needed a message of forgiveness and salvation, and only Jesus' word can do it. Not more time, not more productivity, not more assistance, only Jesus' word. That wonderful message of salvation, no matter how much the world may want to drown it out with distractions, will never be taken away from you. What's competing for your attention today? Many good distractions. The work emails will still come asking for willing volunteers for overtime and business travel. The registration forms for soccer camps and summer activities will still pile up your inbox. Your family and friends will still want to take trips for you to maximize the end of the summer. Your body will still call out to you for more rest and sleep. But Lord, all of those good things pale in comparison to the best thing. But Lord, I just want to remain focused on what you do for me and on what I do for you. But Lord, what else would I want to do with my time? In our busy lives, filter out all of those distractions and focus on the best thing of Jesus' word. Take the one best necessity over the many good distractions. As I look out, I see a lot of Marys sitting at the feet of Jesus and listening to what he has to say. Filtering out all of the distractions all of the noise, all of the clutter. So keep coming to church, keep reading your Bibles, keep paging to a devotion. And there you will find the one thing needful. And no matter what the world may want to do with it, it will never be taken away from you. To be honest, I have to admit that I felt a lot like, Mary, like Martha this summer. With a new baby crying in the background every night, uh, with baby toys that I have to crawl over in our living room, with juggling responsibilities between not one but two churches, with trying to make the house presentable for both sets of parents who want to come on by, with poring over books and journal articles to prepare for my summer classes, and now with weighing a new call, I've felt pretty overwhelmed. Right when I want to cry out, Lord, tell someone to help me. 
he calmly says, you are worried and upset about many things, but one thing is needed. Right then, my sinful nature wants to retort, well, great Jesus, you're just trying to pile on one more thing to my plate. But Jesus knows better. I'm not trying to pile more things onto your plate. I'm taking things off your plate. I'm taking off all of your stress and sin, your clutter and confusion, your distractions and disarray. So just slow down. Take a seat and come and listen to me. Amen.